hypocrite. And they could preach and open their mouths and say the very words that the Spirit of the Almighty wanted them to say. And so they didn't have to spend hours and hours in sermon preparation week after week. I'm not complaining. <coughs> How neat that would have been. That when you stood to address an audience such as this, when you opened your mouth, God is powerfully speaking through you. Wouldn't that have been cool? And you know, when the prophet spoke, everybody loved it. And everybody listened to the prophets and they would sit on the edge of their seat just waiting to hear more of what the prophets had to say. And when the prophets would wrap up their messages, when they would conclude their sermons, they'd go strolling through the streets of Jerusalem, high-fiving everybody in the audience, listening to everybody say, Great sermon, Mr. Prophet! That was amazing! Folks, you know that wasn't the prophet's existence at all, right? In fact, if you've read about the prophets in the Old Testament, you know that their experience was nothing like that. The Scriptures make it very clear that the prophets oftentimes had a miserable existence on this earth. The prophets were hated vehemently by most of the people to whom they preached. Usually, when the prophets of God were speaking, people did this. Because they didn't want to hear anything that God had to say to them. The prophets were often persecuted, even to the point of death. Gruesome death, in some cases. The men whom God called to be prophets, they were often very reluctant to accept their calling. Almost as if they were saying to God, please, anyone but me. I am not the man you want for the job. All of the prophets suffered in some way. Some prophets suffered much more than others. And when I think about suffering prophets, I immediately think about Jeremiah. The weeping prophet, as he is called. Because his book is wet with his own tears for his nation. Jeremiah is a prophet who was tender hearted, who oftentimes cried over the direction that his people were moving in. But not only did he cry because of the evil and the wickedness that was in the land of Judah, he also cried because God made it very clear to Jeremiah and made it clear to the people through Jeremiah that God was about to devastate Judah and bring them to nothing because of their sin and their wickedness. <clears throat> I won't say that Jeremiah suffered more than any other prophet. But I will say you would be hard-pressed to find another prophet that suffered more than Jeremiah. <laughs> Jeremiah suffered and his sufferings are recorded in vivid detail. And at multiple times in the book of Jeremiah, it seems that he reaches a breaking point where he just throws his hands up and he says to God, I've had it. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And when Jeremiah does that in chapter 12, it says in verse 1, Righteous are you, O Lord, that I would plead my case with you. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice with you. It's almost as if Jeremiah is saying, God, I have a bone to pick with you. And he goes on to say, I look around and wicked people are prospering. People who are evil and, and just unrighteous and ungodly, they are doing really well. They're eating well and their purses are fat and they've got all their needs taken care of. And then there's poor old me. I'm trying to do everything you want me to do. I am preaching to people who hate my guts. God, it seems like justice is not being served here. Can we talk about this? Now Jeremiah is by no means irreverent in any of this, but he is giving these these complaints to God. And so God says to him in verse 5, 
If you have run with footmen and they have tired you out, then how will you compete with the horses? I want to think about that expression with you this morning. Can you run with the horses? God says to Jeremiah. You ever tried to outrun a horse? Me neither. But I'm pretty certain I couldn't do it. I'm pretty sure I couldn't do it. You know, I was never fast. Never. I was always this big, slow kid. And when I was playing basketball, I realized that big, slow kids don't make it very far. And so I played baseball instead, where you can be slow and still be a good baseball player. In fact, I was a pitcher. I didn't have to run anywhere. It was great. Great for a slow kid to be a pitcher. I'm pretty certain I couldn't compete with a horse in a foot race. Now we're going to come back to this expression toward the end of our lesson and talk about what God is saying here. But before we do that, let's set the stage a little bit. And let's talk about Jeremiah and his work and his preaching and his sufferings and his discouragement. And then after we've done that, we're going to come back to this expression and make some applications to you and me, okay? So let's start off with this. Let's talk about Jeremiah's call. Be turning to chapter 1, if you would. This was the passage that Brother David read for us at the beginning of our service this morning. Jeremiah chapter 1. I mentioned that some of the men that God called to be prophets were reluctant to take on this task. And Jeremiah is a clear example of that. He is called as a very young man by God to be a prophet. Chapter 1 and verse 6 Jeremiah says, Alas, Lord God, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. I'm a young man. I'm too young to be a prophet. And God says, Don't say that you're a young man. Because everywhere I send you, you will go. And all that I command you, you will speak. Jeremiah is likely a teenager when God calls him here. Maybe in his late teenage years. And God is calling him to a pretty substantial task. He's going to be prophesying for the better part of 40 years. And so Jeremiah has decades of suffering in his preaching ahead of him. And so he has to start young. So God calls him as a teenager and he's reluctant about that. But God tells him in chapter 1 and verse 18 that you are going to prophesy to kings, to princes, to priests or the religious leaders, and even all of the people of Jerusalem. You are going to be before them, he says, verse 18, a fortified city and a pillar of iron, and you will be as walls of bronze against the whole land to kings of Judah. Jeremiah would prophesy to multiple kings in Judah's final years to its princes, to its priests, and to the people of the land. And God says in verse 19 that they are going to fight you on every occasion. He says, they will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. It's interesting that Jeremiah was told by God on multiple occasions, you do not pray for this nation. This nation, Jeremiah, is so wicked and so evil, don't even try to intercede for them in prayer. Because even a man as righteous as you, a man as godly as you, if you pray for them, it won't do them any good because they are so far gone. Look at chapter 7 and verse 16. Chapter 7 and verse 16. God says to Jeremiah, As for you, do not pray for this people, and do not lift up cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I will not hear you. So not only did Jeremiah have people in the audience in Judah who would close their ears to his words, God says to him, If you try to pray on behalf of the nation, I'll close my ears. And I won't listen. In chapter 11, verse 14, God says this again. Therefore do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or a prayer for them, for I will not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. Even when they call out to me and ask for me to remove Babylonian destruction, 
and spare them, I'm not going to do it. It's too late. If you were to characterize Jeremiah's preaching, you would say, he's a negative preacher. That's putting it pretty mildly. You would say Jeremiah is a hellfire and brimstone kind of preacher. Because every sermon he preached, it was doom and gloom and destruction. Uh, back in chapter 6, back in chapter 6, while Jeremiah is preaching doom and gloom and it's too late, you can't repent anymore, God is at the end of His rope with you, while Jeremiah is preaching that, there's other prophets in the land, false prophets, who are also preaching to the people. And you know what they're saying? Everything's fine. Hey, everything's good. Listen, I know that Babylon is surrounding our city, and I know that we're in a famine right now and people are eating their children, but hey, everything's fine. No big deal. So in chapter 6 and in verse 13, for from the least of them even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the brokenness of my people saying, peace, peace. But there is no peace. And Jeremiah is able to see right through what the false prophets are saying. And he says, you guys are telling everybody that everything's fine, when in reality... We are about to be slaughtered. In chapter 7, you have what's called Jeremiah's temple sermon. He stands in the gate of the Lord's house and he preaches this strong, condemning message. And he tells the people, don't listen to the false prophets. So he says in verse 4, do not trust in deceptive words saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, the false prophets are going around telling the people, hey, this is Jerusalem. The temple of Jehovah God is here. And as long as the temple is standing, God is inside it. And if God is inside the temple, nothing's going to happen to us. Jeremiah says, don't listen to those deceptive words. The false prophets have not been sent to you by God. Chapter 14. Here, Jeremiah speaks to God about these false prophets. And he says in verse 13, But alas, Lord God, I said, Look, the prophets are telling them, you will not see the sword, nor will you have famine, but I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. And so the false prophets are characterizing Jeremiah as just this cantankerous preacher who's always railing against sin and evil and doom and gloom. And here are the prophets saying, listen to us. Don't you like our message so much better? We're giving you these very smooth and pleasing and flattering words. What's God's assessment of them? Well, what did we just read in verse 14? He says, I didn't send those men. Jeremiah is the one preaching the truth of God and nobody is listening to it. In fact, who is it that's winning the day? Jeremiah or these false prophets? Well, you know the answer, but look at chapter 5. And look at verse 30. Chapter 5, verse 30. Love to hear these pages turning. Thank you. Chapter 5, verse 30. An appalling and a horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule on their own authority and my people love it, God says. The prophets are lying to the people, but the people love to hear what the prophets are saying. The priests, 
the religious leaders, the moral compass of the people. They're just doing whatever they want to do. They're just making up their own rules and they are, are asserting their power over the people doing whatever they want to do. And the people are just accepting it. And they even love it when these false prophets are preaching what they're preaching. Jeremiah has suffered tremendously as a prophet of Jehovah God. In chapter 15 and verse 10, we're told that people cursed him and wished that evil things would come upon him. In chapter 20, let's look at this one. Chapter 20, Jeremiah has an enemy throughout the book. His name is Pashur, the priest. We're introduced to him in chapter 20 in verse 1. It says that he was the chief officer in the house of the Lord, and he heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Pashur had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put him in stocks that were at the upper Benjamin gate, which was by the house of the Lord. This man, throughout the book, goes out of his way to just make Jeremiah's life miserable. And even in this chapter, in verse 10, Jeremiah says, I have heard the whispering of many people, terror on every side. And they are saying, denounce him. Let us denounce him. Even my trusted friends watching for my fall saying, perhaps he will be deceived so that we may prevail against him and take our revenge on him. There were officials in Jerusalem who tried to kill Jeremiah and plot against his life. Because Jeremiah was saying, you need to submit to Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon is coming and you need to submit to Babylon. And instead, the kings and the princes in Judah, they're saying, no, no, we're going to stay here inside our walled city and we're going to trust in the temple because God is going to protect us. And Jeremiah says, no, he's not. <laughs> Jeremiah is going to level this city to the ground and you need to be submissive to Babylon. And so all of the officials in the city said, you're a traitor. Shame on you for telling us we need to submit to Babylon. And so the officials wanted him killed. Jeremiah would eventually be beaten. He would be imprisoned. He would be bound in chains and even thrown into a dungeon left to die. Perhaps the most troubling of all is what happens back in chapter 11. Jeremiah is from a city, a small city called Anathoth. It's a few miles northeast of Jerusalem. Even people from his own city turned against him. In chapter 11, verse 18, Moreover, the Lord made it known to me, and I knew it. Then you showed me their deeds. But Jeremiah says, I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. And I did not know that they had devised plots against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. That's Jeremiah they're talking about. He's the tree. Cut him off. But, O Lord, verse 20, who judges righteously, who tries the feelings in the heart, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you I have committed my cause. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth, who seek your life, saying... Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord so that you will not die at our hand. That's what they're telling Jeremiah. Stop prophesying in the name of the Lord. Therefore, verse 22, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am about to punish them. The young men will die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters will die by famine. And a remnant will not be left to them. For I will bring disaster on the men of Anathoth the year of their punishment. Now, if you start to go into chapter 12 where Jeremiah gives this prayer and he says, God, I don't understand. Help me make sense of all of this. I'm struggling. I'm, I'm being persecuted. You come to chapter 12 and verse 6 and notice what God says to him. Even your brothers and the household of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Even they have cried aloud after you. Even Jeremiah's own family turned against him. How heartbreaking that must have been. So what if the kings of Judah don't listen to my preaching? 
So what if the princes and the priests and the false prophets don't listen to my preaching? This is Jeremiah's family. And even they are involved in this plot to take his life. So Jeremiah, he's at his wit's end to say the least. He's overwhelmed. And in this prayer from chapter 12 that we read from a moment ago, that's when God says to him, how are you going to run with the horses? And here's what he means. Look at verse 5 again. If you have run with the footmen and they have tired you out, then how can you run with the horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? Basically what God says to Jeremiah there is, Jeremiah, what you have experienced is nothing compared to what you're going to face in the future. Now realize he's speaking up until this point. What you've experienced up until this point is nothing compared to what you're going to face in the future. And if you've been running with the foot soldiers, if you've been running with the foot racers, running against fellow men in all these experiences that you've had thus far, if that's worn you out, what are you going to do when it's time for the Kentucky Derby? What are you going to do when you face real challenges? What are you going to do when it gets really tough, Jeremiah? You see, God wants Jeremiah to run with the horses. God needs Jeremiah to do His will and to accomplish great things. And when I say accomplish great things, I don't mean convert the nation. I don't mean go out and preach and make everybody believe in His message and the whole nation turns back to God. That's not going to happen. We're way past that point in Israel's history. But Jeremiah can preach the message that the Spirit of God wants him to preach. And he can do it boldly and courageously. And even if nobody listens to him, Jeremiah is still doing great things for God. So how are you going to run with the horses? But can you and I consider that question? How are we going to run with the horses? You know, sometimes, as Jeremiah did, when you look back on all of his experiences, we get discouraged. Just like Jeremiah got discouraged. Jeremiah got depressed. He was frustrated. He was angry. He had questions that there were seemingly no answers to. Does that ever happen to you? Has that ever happened to you? You know, when we get discouraged, I wonder if God wouldn't look at us and ask the same question. How are you going to contend with the horses? What are you going to do when things get really bad in your life? How will we face discouragement? Times where we're overwhelmed, times where we're down. How can we keep on doing what God wants us to do, even in the face of discouragement? Because that's exactly what Jeremiah did. I'm not usually one to make book recommendations, but I'm going to do that, okay? I'm going to give you a book recommendation for those of you who like to read. This book was recommended to me a long time ago, and I just now bought it this week. Four days ago, three days ago, when I started my daily Bible reading uh, on Jeremiah, I was reminded of this book. The book is called He Who Wept. He Who Wept. It's the story of Jeremiah. Uh, the author's name is Tom Lemons, T-H-O-M, Lemons, two M's in Lemons. Tom Lemons, he who wept. Um, you can buy it in paperback. I think it's out of print, though, so you might pay a high price for it. I bought the Kindle version. It was like $1.99, all right? So that, that's what I did. I can't stop reading this book, folks. It's fascinating. And this book is a historical novel based on the book of Jeremiah. And so what this guy Lemons does, he just takes the book of Jeremiah and he just turns it into a novel. Okay? It is very true to the text. Uh, so read that if, if you'd like to get a little bit deeper insight into the life 
in the circumstances of Jeremiah. Uh, okay, that's enough. You're welcome, Tom Lemons. Now, what I see in God's book of Jeremiah, as well as Mr. Lemons' book about Jeremiah, is that even in the midst of this opposition and this discouragement and frustration where Jeremiah just throws his hands up and he says, I'm done. He never really was done. He kept on going. He kept on preaching. He kept doing what God wanted him to do. Even, even when he was an old man and people... I mean, folks, Jeremiah preached the same sermon, okay? I mean, throughout the book, his message was always the same. We are going to be punished for the evil that we have done. And he preached it for over 40 years. It's like when Jeremiah would walk up to the pulpit, everybody said, yeah, we know, here it comes, same sermon he's been preaching every day for 40 years. That's basically what he did. And yet he kept doing it. He kept going. The question is, how did he do that? What do we learn from Jeremiah? If he could run with the horses to just keep on keeping on, how can we do it? So what did Jeremiah do? i got three things, of course. I have three things that I see Jeremiah doing that I think will help us keep on keeping on even when we are discouraged. Here's the first thing. Jeremiah didn't pretend to be somebody that he wasn't. I think this is really important. I mentioned to you that Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. He was a man of tears. He is a man who mourned over his nation every day, I take it. Look at Jeremiah chapter 4. And listen to the emotion of Jeremiah here. Chapter 4, verse 19. My soul, my soul... I am in anguish. Oh, my heart. My heart is pounding within me. I cannot be silent. Because you have heard, oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. D disaster on disaster is proclaimed for the whole land is devastated. In other words, the Babylonians are coming and they are going to wipe out our city. And he says... Just rip my heart out of my chest because of what's going to happen to my people. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. <clears throat> Tell you what, I'm going to reverse the order of the passages on the screen. Chapter 9 and verse 1 is really the conclusion of this text in chapter 8. So look at chapter 8 first and look at verse 18. My sorrow is beyond healing. My heart is faint within me. Behold, listen, the cry of the daughter of my people from a distant land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not within her? In other words, I hear the cries of my people who are in Babylon in captivity. All the way back here, I can hear them crying because of what they are suffering. Verse 20, harvest is past, summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the brokenness of the daughter of my people, I am broken. I mourn. Dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has not the health of the daughter of my people been restored? Oh, that my head were waters and that my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah cries as he's preaching. He cries as he is speaking the words and Baruch, his, scroll, uh, his scribe rather, is writing them down on a scroll. Jeremiah is a man of tears. And for that he was not ashamed. He was a very tender-hearted man, but please know that that doesn't mean Jeremiah was weak. Jeremiah is actually one of the strongest men we read about in the Bible. When you look at all of the things that he suffered, all the things that he faced, you don't walk away from the book of Jeremiah and say, that guy was a weakling. What a little girl Jeremiah was. No, no, far from it. You know, we might be tempted to say to Jeremiah, hey, 
Listen up, buddy. If you're going to face your enemies, you got to get tough. you got to grit your teeth and clench up your fist, and you just got to punch your enemies in the mouth. you got to show them who's boss. That is not the kind of man Jeremiah was. And so our advice to Jeremiah would have been, you need to be somebody that you're not. If you want to overcome discouragement, you need to pretend that you're somebody else. You need to act like you're somebody else. You need to stop all this crying business. Stop walking around with tissues in your pocket. And you need to start doing some bench press, Jeremiah. That's what we would say. But folks, telling ourselves that everything is fine and pretending that everything is okay and pretending that we're not struggling, that won't work in order to help us overcome discouragement. Telling ourselves that everything's okay and lying to ourselves isn't going to work, but neither is bowing up and pretending to be strong and acting, putting on the facade of strength if that's not really who we are. You know, there are people who can kind of bow up and grit their teeth and face challenges. That's great. But not everybody's like that. Jeremiah wasn't like that. Discouragement, folks, depression, frustration, it's a real thing. And there are lots of people who struggle with it, even Christians. And I want to tell you, if you're going to confront it, don't pretend to be somebody you're not. Because that's not what Jeremiah did. He stayed true to himself, and he kept on plugging along. Here's the second thing Jeremiah did. Jeremiah spoke very openly and candidly to God about it. He prayed to God on a regular basis. At least 14 times in the book, we're told that Jeremiah spoke to God about his concerns. Chapter 20 is an interesting one to me. There are others, but let's just look at this one. Chapter 20. This is right after that Pashur fella that I mentioned earlier tries to make Jeremiah's life miserable. And Jeremiah comes to God in verse 7 of chapter 20. And he says, O oh Lord, you have deceived me. And I was deceived. You have overcome me. And you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry aloud, I proclaim violence and destruction because for me the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. Now as he continues this prayer, he tells us in verse 9 that he had just resolved to just quit preaching. He says, but if I say I will not remember him or speak anymore in his name, I'm just going to quit. I don't want to suffer anymore. I, I, I'm done with this. I'm tired of the persecution. He says, if I say that, and then the rest of verse 9 is where a lot of preachers really shuck the corn. Then in my heart, it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones and I am weary of holding it in and I cannot endure it. I am weary of the persecution and the suffering that I'm experiencing. But if I tell myself I'm just going to quit preaching the words of God, it becomes even more of a weariness for me to do that. And so God's word is like fire in my bones and I've got to let it out. But did you notice in verse 7, when he starts this prayer, he says, God, you deceived me. Now there's some translational differences that come across in verse 7. Not all translations use the word deceived. But if I understand the original text correctly, Jeremiah uses some pretty graphic language here. And I'm not going to say the words because of the sensitive and tender ears, the youthful ears in our audience. But the word that Jeremiah uses here is a word that other places in Scripture use to refer to a man forcing himself upon a woman. And God says to, or Jeremiah rather, says to God, that's what you have done to me. Had your way with me. Wow. You're going to speak to God that way? You're going to use that kind of language when you pray to God? 
Jeremiah just pours out his anger and his frustration and his bitterness and his sorrow and his emptiness and his despair. And he just lays it out there before God with brutal candor. Listen, folks, it is okay to pray like that. It's all over the Scripture. Read the book of Psalms. It's everywhere. You see this kind of prayers all through the Bible. Now let me say this for balance to that. Doesn't mean that we're trying to be irreverent or disrespectful. Do you think Jeremiah is irreverent? You think Jeremiah is going out of his way to be disrespectful to God? No, that's not the impression that I get at all. I don't think Jeremiah would ever do that. But these are words that are spoken out of just brutal honesty because of what Jeremiah is feeling in his heart. He is suffering anguish of the worst kind. And he's trying to make sense of everything that's happening. He's trying to understand all of this and he just can't do it. So he is speaking to God in this brutal candor. And folks, it is okay for us to do that. Now, we may never do it because we may not experience the kinds of things that Jeremiah experienced. And I get that. But our prayers to God when we are discouraged and troubled and frustrated, our prayers don't have to stay half an inch deep. They don't have to be superficial. We can open up with God. We can be real with God because here's the thing. Whether we pray it, whether we say it or not, God knows if it's in here. So you might as well say it. Pour your heart out to Him. Jeremiah could do that. He could express this to God because I think, number three, he never forgot that God was with him. Back in chapter 1, when he was called by God to be his prophet, God said, they will oppose you at every turn, but I am with you. And there may have been times where Jeremiah thought, I don't know about that. Sure would be nice if you were a little bit closer to me. If I didn't have to go through all of this. And yet, ultimately, Jeremiah knew God is still there. Look at chapter 16. Chapter 16. What we see in Jeremiah is that he's able to look beyond the immediate hardship that he is facing and that his people as a nation are facing. He's able to look beyond even the captivity in Babylon, the 70-year captivity. Look at verse 14. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He says people aren't going to say that anymore. They're not going to talk about God bringing His people out of Egypt. What they're going to talk about instead, verse 15, is, as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries where He had banished them. For I will restore them to their own land which I gave to their fathers. Jeremiah is looking beyond the captivity. And he says, I'm, I'm thinking about the time when God's going to bring us all back. Now, Jeremiah's not going to live to see that, and he knows that. But those young ones who were carried off into captivity, they might get to come back. And God's going to restore the blessings to His people again when He brings them back to their land. In chapter 32, we'll not look at this, but, but God told Jeremiah, He said, you go buy a tract of land. You go buy a field. And you do that as a sign to your people to say to them, I am buying land here in the promised land that God gave to us because although we're about to be carried off into captivity, we're going to come back. And this land is going to be used again. It's going to be tilled again. It's going to produce again. It's going to be blessed by God again. It's okay to be discouraged. But even in those times of discouragement, remember, God has made promises to you and me. The same promises that He made to Jeremiah. 
He will never leave us or forsake us. As long as we stay true to Him, as long as we stay faithful to Him, God will be faithful to us. Now what's significant about all this to me in the life of Jeremiah is that nothing changed for him. You know, Jeremiah didn't go through a, a change where he, he, he started preaching a different kind of a message and he started doing something completely different and then people started responding to him and he became everybody's favorite preacher. That didn't happen to Jeremiah. He kept preaching the same sermon to the same people who responded in the same way and yet he ran with horses. He faced those challenges, even greater challenges than the footman posed. He faced them head on. <clears throat> and what that tells me is, when we're discouraged, when we're frustrated, we just got to keep on keeping on. And eventually, we're going to come through it. If we stay true to ourselves, if we speak openly to God about our concerns, and if we remember that God is always with us, we too can run with horses. Thank you for your attention this morning. We extend the invitation to those who need to come to Christ and obey the gospel this morning. We're ready to help you do that if that's your need or if you need to come back to the Lord and renew your dedication and your service to Him. We are ready to assist you this morning. We invite you, please come as we stand and sing together.